Well, just in case you were wondering, um, Candy Crush during the service is also not necessarily a good thing, you know, just in case you were asking for a friend. <laughs> it's good to be with you uh, this morning as we continue this message series and looking at different questions that people have about God, about faith, about life, but might be just a little bit nervous to ask. Some of you know this, but my, my dad is a, a pastor. And when I was a kid, he would often be gone in the evenings for meetings at church or meetings with, uh, with people. And for whatever reason, most of it was unwarranted. I remember as a kid being nervous when my dad was gone in the evening. I, I had it in my head, uh, the opinion, the idea that no matter what thing could happen or whether there was maybe even an intruder that would come into our home, I had it in my head that my dad was big enough and he was strong enough to take care of any situation or problem or intruder that might come our way. And as I, um, as I grew up, I came to recognize that I have a pretty awesome dad. But... He's not big enough or bigger than any problem and any intruder. I came to find out, and maybe this is true of your dad too, that um, my dad may not always be able to beat up your dad. <laughs> and he's a great dad, but I came to see that my childhood understanding of how great my dad was was just a little bit different than the reality of who he was. And I'm guessing as you think about some of the things you thought about life or about your family, your parents, when you were a kid, there was a certain point in your life where you kind of, your eyes are open, you recognize, what? It isn't exactly the way I thought when I was a child. And that can happen, where we begin to have questions about things that we thought or believed when we were children. And did you know the same thing can happen when it comes to the things that we think or the things that we believe about God? I'm guessing that for many of you, maybe even most of you online or in the room, that you learned, first learned about God when you were a kid. Maybe you learned about who God is and what he's like from a parent or from a pastor, maybe even from a Sunday school teacher. And you had this basic childhood understanding of who God is, that he loves you always, that he's there for you and will help you, that he sent Jesus to be your savior. And even as adults, man, if that's what you know and believe, that, that is at the heart and core of who God is. But I'm guessing that at a certain point in your life as you grew up, that your childhood understanding of God, he's good, he loves you all the time, he's with you, and Jesus is your savior, that that childhood understanding of God collides with the difficulty and complexity of life. That the things you experience in life don't seem to always mesh with what you have learned or understood about God. And if that's happened to you, man, it happens to all of us. And what happens is this, that it leaves you with questions. You begin to have questions about God and questions about faith and questions about life as you remember what you've learned, but then face the realities of life that are right in front of you. And when you have those questions, there's a part of you, if you're anything like me, that asks, am I the only one who has these questions? Or, or maybe even you ask yourself this, um, can I be a believer and have these questions? <laughs> can I go to church? Can I be a part of a church and have these questions about God and about faith? One of the goals, and Pastor Matt mentioned this last week of this series, is that we want you to know that it's okay to have questions. We want to normalize the understanding that we all have questions about God and about faith. In fact, if you don't have questions, I, part of me wonders if you're really thinking or not. And that the best place to bring your questions 
It's right here. To church, to the Bible, and maybe even to your pastors. So today, what we're going to be doing is looking at a question that is very, I would say, base to why we're here and what our life with God is all about. It's this question. Is God real? And I want you to know if you've ever had that question, I understand. It's an understandable question. Here's one of those reasons why. Because as far as I know, none of you have ever seen with your eyes God. So (laughs) then, how do you know that God is real? Right? It's a good question. Maybe you were one of those kids like me who even asked that of my parents, or maybe you asked your Sunday school, question, your Sunday school teacher when you were a kid that question. And if you did, most likely, that Sunday school teacher kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit, not sure exactly what to believe, and maybe even he or she said something like this, you know what, you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith and believe. And okay, there is absolutely truth to that answer. And at the end of the day, faith will always be a part of your relationship with God and your relationship with Jesus. But here's the question for today. Can anything more be said? Is there anything more that we can point to than just, you got to have faith? Because, you know what, this same answer could be applied to a lot of things. Like, if someone was trying to convince you that unicorns and leprechauns are real, They could say this. You just got to have faith. And no amount of faith in leprechauns will ever allow you to find a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. Let me tell you. Do I have your attention yet? As we kind of get going in this, there's a passage Uh, that was written in the Psalms that just really got my head spinning and got me heading in a good direction. It's from Psalm 14. Here's what the psalmist writes. He writes this. It is the fool that says in his heart that there is no God. That Hebrew word for fool, uh, it's a It's a good translation in the English. Uh, Maybe some other word to think about is someone who has no sense, someone who is ignorant. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And what the psalmist is saying is this. He's saying, if you were to objectively look at your life and the world around you, only someone with no brains, (laughs) no sense, only a fool would come away with the idea that there is no God. Only a fool would come to the conclusion that God doesn't exist if you were to look at this objectively. And that leads us to our first fill-in for today. It's this, that I want you to know that yes, faith is a part of this. Faith is the biggest part of understanding whether God is real, but that along with that, God has provided evidence of his existence. Did you know that? Did you know that God has provided little clues for us? And in many ways, I would say they're not even little. They're big clues that he is here, that he is real, that he exists. And there's a number of ways that we could have gone for today. And Problem is, we only have about 30 minutes and not, you know, 90 to go through them all. And so the one that I'm going to concentrate on today, the the clues that God has given to us is in this category, the existence of life and the universe. Now, before we dive in, there's a couple of disclaimers that I I want to give to you guys today. The first is this, that you're going to notice that my message for today, the sermon's just a little bit different than most sermons that I preach in this way, 
that we're going to kind of delve a little bit into an area of theology called apologetics. And what apologetics basically is, is appealing to your reason to better understand what you believe um, and what your beliefs are. And so it's going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to dive a little bit into science to help us better understand, to appeal to that, that reason. I also want you to know that um, no amount of apologetics on its own is ever going to convince someone into faith of God. And so that is not my goal. I firmly believe, because the Bible tells me, it is only the Holy Spirit through the gospel that create faith in God and in Christ. My goal is not to convince you into faith today. It's just to help you better understand that um, faith in a God is not a baseless type of faith, but there's proofs all around us. The other disclaimer that I want to give is that um, I did a bunch of reading in the last couple weeks and also listening to different speakers on um, areas of science and our universe and the world, but in front of my name is the word pastor, not scientist, theologian, not physicist. So I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned, but I am not claiming in any way of being an expert uh, in these areas. So the place where I want to begin is the Word of God, of course. And we're going to go back to the Psalms. And David, a king who uh, was in Israel 3,000 years ago, wrote this about some of the clues that God has left us that he is real. Psalm 19 said, the heavens, not like heaven as to where we will someday go because of Jesus Christ. Here, the heavens, like the universe, the, the, the things you see in the sky, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of a creator, the work of his hands. David is saying, when you look around, when you look up at the sky, when you look at how you're created, when you look at this world, he's saying, it shouts, there's a God. It shouts or proclaims, the skies do, that this was a work of someone's hands, that there is a creator. And then he continues to sort of vet that out a little bit more. He says, day after day, the heavens and the skies, they pour forth speech. Have you ever heard them talk to you? Not what he's talking about. Not that they're audibly that you can hear them. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And yet, they have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet, the voice of the universe, the voice of the skies and the heavens, the voice of this world goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the earth. What David is pointing us to in very clear language is our second fill-in for today. The truth about the universe leads to the truth about God's existence. Now, I hinted at it. These words are written how many years ago? About 3,000 years ago. Just think about how many advances in science, think about how much more we know about the universe and people and the solar system than we did 3,000 years. Think about how much more we know now than just even 50 years ago. And an assumption that you might have is that with all the more that we know since David wrote that 3,000 years ago, that those words in Psalm 19, <laughs> little antiquated at this point, and that maybe the evidence is pointing us more to the fact that there wasn't a creator. And yet, even the more that we know, the more we find science does the unexplainable, except for if there was a creator. That the, the truth of the matter over 3,000 years of science is this, that science 
is not opposed to faith in a God that science continues to point to the reality of God and to a faith in God. So here's where the apologetics part comes in. I want to appeal to three different areas that I just kind of want to get you thinking about. Not only might it help you, but I also think for you who believe in Jesus and in God, it can be great discussion points to either learn more about or to use when you have conversations with people who struggle with the existence of God. And the first area that I want to point to specifically about the universe and life is this topic, to talk a little bit about the origins of the universe. So when you boil down all the different ideas that people could have, whether a believer or an unbeliever, about you know, how the universe came to be, you can pretty much boil them down to, to three different groups. That either God created it, it came from nothing, it just kind of poof, appeared, or it never appeared, it just always existed. And for a very long time in the scientific world, my understanding is that most scientists globbed on to this third one being true. And by the way, most secular scientists come into these types of thinkings with the idea that the, the God part just can't be a, well, a possibility. And so even though all the evidence we'll see points to this, they, they come in with this, well, they don't come in objectively, let's put it that way, okay? But they have always thought, or many years, that, well, the universe just always existed. Well, then, in the 1920s, a gentleman named Edwin Hubble, you may have heard of the Hubble telescope, um, he discovered something that scientists would understand better than us, but I'll share what it was, that the universe is, shows signs that is expanding. And the fact that it's expanding, here's where the scientific part comes in, means that it had to have a beginning. And so now, in 2022, almost every reputable scientist believes that at some point the universe started. That it, that it started. In fact, um, some of you have heard the name Stephen Hawking. Um, here's just one quick quote from Stephen Hawking. He said, all the evidence, all the scientific evidence seems to indicate that the universe has not existed forever, that it had a start. So let's go back to our list. So we can check number three off the list. So now we're left with these two. God created it or it came from nothing. And for, for many years, and, and still there's a certain, well, group of scientists today that have what some have called the, the nothing theory, that the world actually did just kind of poof come to be, and it came from nothing. And even if you're someone who, a scientist who believes in the Big Bang theory, you get to the problem of this. Where did the energy come from so as to have this, well, Big Bang Theory, that impossible odds that that could happen, but where would that energy have come from? It just came from nothing. Now, young people, um, I want you to try this with your parents. Let's say you took out your car and you were driving and you came home and there was a big dent in the side. And your mom or your dad asked, where did that come from? Or what is that? Try this. It's nothing. It came from nothing. And see how that, that works. I'm guessing it's not going to work very well. It's either your fault or someone else's fault, but there's something there and it did not come from nothing. It points to what David wrote. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of a creator, the work of his hands. Or how about this? What if we took some time to think about the conditions for life and the universe to exist and to, well, stay as it is, not imploding? 
Maybe the best way that I've come to understand how all of this works is that as physicists and things have looked at all the different things that have to happen, especially thinking about gravitational pull and all that type of stuff, for everything to kind of, you know, stay working, they likened it to like a soundboard that has over a hundred different dials, and each one of those dials have a million settings, right? And in order for everything to, to work in the universe the way it does and not implode, physicists have come to understand that it has to be so finely tuned that that one gentleman explained it this way, that if you stretched a ruler across the hundreds of billions of light years of the galaxy, that the margin you'd have for just gravity, just one dial, so that things wouldn't implode or, you know, go off into, you know, the distance, the margin is about one inch over a ruler the size of the universe. And that's just one dial of over a hundred different areas. You think about how the earth is perfectly positioned from the sun so that it's not too close that we burn up, not too far away, although I I do think Minnesota is just a little further (laughs) than everything else, but not too far away that we don't freeze up. The intricacies for which the entire universe has to be so finely tuned was described this way um, as if it would have just happened. He said, one scientist, Fred Hoyle, said, it would be as if, if there was no creator, a tornado went through a junkyard, and after it went through, it left a fully functional Boeing 747. (laughs) That to think that this would just happen by chance is the same chance that a tornado would do that. You know what it points to? What David said 3,000 years ago, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Maybe the one that just has shown the reality of a creator or design more than any for scientists has been the the fairly recent discovery of DNA. It's this material found in human beings that carry a very unique genetic code. And in fact, when you look at it scientifically, that DNA actually has an alphabet to it that spells out a, well, I'm going to use the term story. It spells out who you are and why you have what you have genetically. It is a sign to scientists that there is thought, that there is intelligence behind who we are. Um, One cell of DNA or one molecule has 30 encyclopedias worth of information in it. One ounce, a recent Harvard study uh, said, has one million gigabytes of information in one ounce of your DNA. And the scientists look at this, and as they, they, they see this language that some have come to call it the, the language of God, that there have been scientists who have come into this unobjective and have come away from it thinking, how does this happen? Unless there is a creator. Here's what Francis Collins said. He said, and he studied DNA probably um, just as much or more than anybody In the last 50 years, there is no other explanation for the reality and complexity of DNA except for the existence of God. 
And like I said, we could be here another 60 minutes or so with other examples and ideas, but I think this, this helps you understand because here's what our culture, especially our scientific culture, wants us to think. That if we believe in a creator or we believe in, um, in a God, that what's really happening is that we are setting up this scenario that it's, it's faith, those who believe in God, versus the facts of science. That's how they would like us to think. But when you really break it down, when you understand that all these things are called theories because they have no proof, well, it's really an argument of faith in God versus faith in theories. And when you look at the chances of what the scientific community would like to believe us to think about the origins of the universe and of you, when you just look at the evidence that there's a God or, whew, this all just kind of happened out of nothing. Number three, what would you say? This is my conclusion. The evidence points to the reality of God, that David 3,000 years ago was right, even though he didn't have scientists in front of his name either, that the skies proclaim the work of a God. One of uh, probably the most influential atheists of the early 1900s was a, a gentleman by the name of um, Dr. Flew. And he... Um, wrote 17 books on atheism. He traveled Europe uh, having lectures about the fact that there was no God. And then he studied some of these things. And here's what he wrote. I now believe that the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. I believe that this universe's intricate laws manifest what scientists call the mind of God. I believe that life and reproduction originate in a divine source. Why, given that I defended atheism for more than half a century? This is the world picture as I see it that has emerged from modern science. If part of you right now is just sitting in, in wonder about the amazing power and bigness of God. I think that's exactly where David wanted us to be. That as we look at the skies, we look at the world around us, that we recognize that the presence of God, signs, evidence of it is, is all around us. And the more we learn about science, the more that points us to the fact there's something the scientific community can't explain, and we have the answer to that. It's a creator, God. But before we close, <laughs> there could be something else that you might be feeling right now. It would be easy to hear all this and to feel small, kind of hmm, insignificant. In fact, that. I want you to look at this picture. This is a rendition because we can't actually get far enough away to actually get a picture of the, not our solar system, but of the Milky Way galaxy, which our solar system is just a small part of. I want to give you some proportion for a second. If the Milky Way galaxy was condensed so that it became the size of the United States, our solar system, which is humongous, from you know, the sun all the way out to Pluto. Is that a planet? I, they go back and forth, but it's there. If the Milky Way galaxy was the size of the United States of America, our solar system, not our Earth, our solar system would be the size of a dime. And this is one galaxy out of what scientists say are 100 billion-ish galaxies in the universe. Have you ever dropped a dime in your yard? Hard to find. It's pretty small. 
What if you dropped a dime in Lakeville? In the United States. And then you add on top of this that I have this amazing creator God and I, I don't live up to his plans for my life very often. Who am I? I mean, this is, this is our solar system. Can't even see my house on here, much less me. And you begin to think about just how big this universe is. And, and why? Why would God create it so big? It's like I needed a three-bedroom house and I bought the state of Texas, you know? Uh, why so big? Because it wasn't just to give us a home. He created this way to give us a picture. See, here's what I want you to know. That although you might be small, and it's good to feel that way, there's a humility in that that is needed. It doesn't mean that you're insignificant. I think the vastness of this universe God was using to help us understand a different picture, it's found in Psalm 103. Listen to these words for your encouragement. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. How can you even start to fathom that? That's how great his love is for you. As far as the east is from the west, can you put a number on that? Can't. That's the point. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. God didn't have to create the universe this big to give us space, a room. He created it that big to teach us about himself and about his love and his forgiveness you see, the reach of the heavens, it proclaims something else. It proclaims the reach of God's love, which was personified and seen in a God who did not just create you, but loved you so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now we could talk about science all day long. I wouldn't be very good at it, but I know this much. But number four, you can't understand God without understanding his love. So is God real? Have you ever seen him? I will. You will. But for now, he just gives us all these clues, these evidences all around us that there is a creator God. And the next time, next time you're staring in the sky and you see the vastness of his creation, I don't want you to just think about the fact that God is big. But I want you to remember that big God. And that's how big his love is for you through Jesus too. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these opportunities to hear your word and then to consider what, what it means and what glimpses of your, the natural knowledge of God that we have around us and I pray that today as we, um, we hear these things, that your Holy Spirit works through the gospel, that we grow in our faith and in our trust, that we become better equipped to have conversations with people around us who um, 
may not understand always the realities of who you are, that we may have the boldness to share this truth because it is all the difference in the world is you and your son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.